Washington Newsmakers for inside analysis and behind the scenes commentary from Santa Barbara's top journalists about the most important news events in our community. I'm your host, Jerry Roberts. Tonight, we'll look behind these headlines. Leading candidates in the District 3 Council race face tough questions about character. A nasty dispute over Me Too sexual harassment allegations erupts at City College. Three years after the massive pipeline link, authorities open their criminal case against Plains Oil, and the supervisors opt for speed over aesthetics in rebuilding Montecito. Our panel tonight, political writer Josh Molina, Tyler Hayden, news editor of the Santa Barbara Independent, Gianna Magnoli, managing editor of NewsHawk, and investigative reporter Melinda Burns. Thank you all for coming. So, Josh, the last public forum uh, in the District Council, uh, District 3 Council race is over, and uh, the candidates uh, face some questions about campaign contributions, voting records, and other character issues. What's the uh, state of play? Well, we're getting close. Uh, we have four candidates running for council, and they're all working really hard to win election. One of the good things about district elections is that we have, for the first time, people who are solely fo this many candidates solely focused on the west side so say what you will about district elections people are getting um, they are knocking on people's doors at a much higher rate than we've ever seen in any kind of election before so they're making lots of contacts and that, that's good that's good for uh, the district it's good for the, the community it's it's kind of a close race you know some people sort of see Oscar Gutierrez and Michael Vidal as being the, the two front runners, a very close race. And then we've got two other candidates. Uh, but nobody really knows because the voter turnout is going to be pretty like, low. Like 1,500. So Tyler asked, Tyler and I both asked a couple of questions about them. Let, I mean, does anybody care, do the voters care that Michael Vidal has never voted? Uh, I think some voters would care about that because it shows what your involvement is when no one's looking. Of course, everybody wants to be great and perfect when all eyes are on you. But a judge of someone's character is what are they doing when no one's watching? They, he's never voted in a Santa Barbara election. So what does that say? That's up to the voter. Some people will certainly say, well, if you haven't been involved then, <clears throat> why can I trust you to be fully involved now, for other people, they might say, hey, the guy was busy, he's working, he's living in the real world, he never had time to vote. They might give him a pass on that. It's, for some people, it's not a deal breaker. What, 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 what about the allegation that Oscar will be Kathy's, Mayor Kathy Murillo's puppet? Is that uh, something that uh, voters are extremely upset about? Um, you know, a lot of that stuff is just the political, uh, behind-the-scenes stuff. I think that, yes, Oscar is going to need as much help as he can get as any new council member does. He hasn't been a political person. He's somebody who can only run in a district election scenario. And, yeah, if he's got the mayor of Santa Barbara and other top Democrats who are willing to help him, he's going to obviously listen to that. Is he going to be a puppet? I mean, that word is not a good word. You don't think that's a neutral word? But, <laughs> but I think that, yeah, there's going to be some degree of, wow, all these people helped get me elected. I don't know how many times, at least initially, he's going to go against the grain. So far, in terms of his campaign, he's pretty much uh, in line with yeah. all, all the, the platform of Kathy and the Democratic Party. You, you uh, moderated the debate uh, forum, I guess. What was your takeaway? Yeah, it was kind of interesting how Oscar answered that. I thought he was a little bit defensive, um, surprisingly. He was defensive. Um, years, he, yeah. he got he got a little hot in color. I mean, I I guess I don't blame him. You know, he's he feels like he's being, as he said, judged for something that hasn't even done yet. But I think it's a fair question. Which is an but, interesting way of making it. It hasn't happened yet. Right. Wait a minute. Right. But well, that's, what hasn't happened? But that's yet. the question: is how are you gonna? Yeah. How are you gonna act when you get up there? I mean, it'll be interesting to see if he's elected for the sake of argument. If he, you know, uh, takes stands against. Uh, Kathy's moves just to, to sort of uh, put out a message, you know, to kind of prove his point that he's not going to be a puppet to her or if he'll just fall straight in line. I don't know, but he, he's also always said that um, he's, you know, he's his own guy. He, he was kind of, um, 
even when he worked for the channels, you know, he would he would do his own thing. He wouldn't just follow marching orders for the sake of doing so. That he issued, initiated his own projects, his own reporting. So, um, it's a it's a big unanswered question. I think the bigger story here is all four of the candidates. None, nobody's blowing anybody away here. We have candidates who are. That's a very diplomatic <laughs> statement. <laughs> We have candidates who are not politically involved up until now. We have candidates who, I mean, Oscar was not even a registered Democrat until January, until somebody told him, if you want to get the party's Don't endorsement. Don't tell Gail Tita and Land this If you want to get the party's endorsement, you've got to be a Democrat. So he, you know, and he, he told me, and I reported it, that, oh, I was an independent, but I always thought I was a Democrat. So, I mean, we, we don't have... A, a batch of candidates that are totally blowing away the, 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 the voters. So it'll be interesting to see who rises to the top. We have a City College student, 22. She's actually pretty Elizabeth bright. Elizabeth Hunter. She's very bright. She's intelligent. She's very strong on the environmental issues, probably the, the most strong of all of the candidates. But she's young and hasn't done a lot and, and ha doesn't have the experience. So voters will probably be turned off by that. I think to a and large... Ken Revis. Yeah, Ken's another guy. He's, you know, he's involved. He's connected. He's done stuff. He would not be viable in any race other than a district election, but he's got kind of a fragmented background. He's done more stuff on the east side than the west side. Voters are going to go with ultimately what they always do: who they like as a person, who who they can connect with, who they feel like, hey, I can identify with this person. So, it's probably going to come down to Oscar and uh, and uh, Michael and. I think it's going to be a very close race. Yeah. Who's yeah. going to win? I think Oscar. I think he's got the edge. Who do you think is going to win? I think Oscar's going to win. Who do you think is going to win? I have seen the most stuff for both of those two, so I think they'll be close. Um, I have to report on <laughs> whoever is elected, but I would yeah. say that Michael is probably the front runner because I think he himself individually is working harder than Oscar to knock on doors because he has to. He does not have the benefit of the network of the Democratic Party. And the big story out of this is if Michael wins, we're going to have three examples now where the Democratic Party endorsed candidate True. did not win in a district election. That's and so that's going to change the whole conversation of whether the Democrats should keep doing this thing where I'm going to come out way before the election, or if we're going to kind of let things play out and take our time and find the viable candidate. Michael is a Democrat. Yeah. He's just not the one that they interviewed first. The correct answer, Josh. The winner of District 3 on the West Side Council seat will be Sharon Byrne. <laughs> All right. Tyler, there's been a... Uh, thank you. Nice job. Avoiding, avoiding your prediction. I, I, you told, you, I told you, you what I said. Yeah, I know. That's okay. I, I will say this. <laughs> Elizabeth Hunter, right? It's going to get more votes than people, people think. think. Yes. She was great in the forum, I thought, this last one. Yeah. She did well. All right, Tyler, tell us about this controversy at City College about uh. sexual harassment allegations involving a star guest lecturer, the faculty, and the student newspaper. Yeah, so this goes back to March 19th. Um, there was an invitation sent out to a well-known well science writer and historian named Michael Shermer to, to be a guest lecturer on campus, um, part of an annual faculty colloquium. And uh, soon before he was set to speak, an email went out uh, from one of the City College professors highlighting some uh, sexual assault allegations against him. Reported by BuzzFeed. Reported by BuzzFeed. Take, you know, take that as you, as you will. Um, and she said, you know, people should be aware of this at least. Um, you can choose to support this event or not. Um, she had some pretty strong language in there about you know, people maybe wanting to, to be careful around this guy, especially late at night. This is Professor Napoleon. Correct, yep. Yeah. She, so she, she put it all out there, and, and uh, it, it came right back at her. So she got a lot of response from, this went to the, to the entire campus, through their all-campus email system, which is seen by faculty and staff. Um, and it immediately got a lot of heated responses, both in support of her and in uh, support of Shermer. You know, these are just accusations. These are being prosecuted. Um, she's also got the right to, to air these, these allegations. Um, and uh, it got really ugly really quickly. And he, the next day... Well, the channels reported. Right, good point. So, the, yeah, there's a lot of steps involved in this. <laughs> the channels reported that day um, that 
this email had been sent out, that the school had decided to allow Shermer to speak. Um, they was, the report was basically just based on these all-campus e uh, all email exchanges and the, and the uh, response of the, of the school. He came and spoke. The next day, I think he um, was, was told or caught wind at least that he had been the subject of this email. A lot of threats, a lot of... Um, Threatened a lawsuit. Lawsuit, legal threats went out. Against the channels. Against the channels, against the school, against Dr. Napoleon, defamation of character, libel, all that good stuff. Um, he demanded a retraction, a full retraction from the channels and an apology from Napoleon. Didn't get either, uh, set a deadline, didn't get either by the deadline, um, and then actually sent another round of, of cease and desist letters to the channels, to the school, to Dr. Napoleon. Eventually dropped uh, his threats, never filed an official lawsuit. But the fallout, fallout has been pretty severe on campus. There's a lot of debate and discussion whether Dr. Napoleon did the right thing, if the college handled um, the immediate aftermath properly, um, and, and now there's, there's extra bits of um, uh, ugliness with, with some of the faculty there. McIntyre has been... Yeah, so the professor who, Professor Mark McIntyre, who invited um, Michael Shermer to speak. He, um, he, and he was a very vocal supporter of Dr. Shermer um, in, this, in these email exchanges and very critical of Dr. Napoleon. He, after 22 years of teaching at Santa Barbara City College, will no longer be teaching. Um, he, he was a, uh, an adjunct professor, so his contract just wasn't renewed. He wasn't fired. And um, the reasons for his uh, the non renewal of his contract are ostensibly um, issues with his teaching and, and his, uh, his approach to uh, his philosophy class. And from what I understand, this is all kind of happening right now, that this incident was not um, cited as a reason for his... Of course not. Right. Don't, don't say anything about this because you have a conflict of interest. <laughs> He's probably got the most to say. Melinda, <laughs> you agree with me, do you not, that there is an important debate underlying this entire incident, which is what is the standard of proof now about sexual harassment, sexual assault even? Ever since the, how the Harvey Weinstein case, it's almost seemed as if every allegation is followed by uh, either dismissal or, or something of usually the male, although not, not, not always. Certainly there's a case up in Sacramento with an assemblywoman and that's going on. Do you think there's a danger here that due process is being lost? Yes, I do. And I think, I mean, questions uh, that I have, did, the, did uh, City College do its own investigation of, of, uh, of the charges? Did they? Oh, shit. Um, yeah, how did they come to the decisions uh, that they did? Um, I, I just think it's, it's a very, um, it, it's really kind of a, a zero tolerance age, and that means immediate action. So there wasn't. And, a, they didn't do an investigation. Well, they found out I think a few hours before he was he was set to speak about these allegations. It sounds like they didn't even the organizers didn't know. That's at least what I've heard. There's some suspicion that Mark McIntyre may have may have known um, and either chose not to investigate them or had looked into them himself and dismissed them as as uh, unfounded. Um, so it's not totally clear what official investigative steps the college took um, before, during, or after all of this. But but things are in kind of a nasty uh, atmosphere now? Well, now, um, yeah, a lot of the students um, are upset with how the college handled this. Um, they feel like the Dr. Napoleon maybe wasn't properly protected by some of the um, criticism and you could even argue sort of... Um, bullying or attacks that she's received from, from people because of this. Um, there, you know, a student group formed in direct uh, response to this. There's a GoFundMe page that's raising money for her legal bills um, that she incurred when she was, you know, potentially defending herself against the lawsuit. So it's all a mess and it's still going on. All right. Well, we'll I imagine we're going to hear more about this. Yeah, I think so. All right. All right, Gianna, so almost three years to the day after almost. the planes, uh, pipeline incident, the district attorney and the attorney general finally got their company in the court. What's, what's happened at the trial so far? They do. The 
so it's a criminal trial and they started opening statements and they've had a few witnesses already testifying. So far, it's all public agencies in Santa Barbara County. It's the first responders. So they're talking about getting the call for the smell of gas in the general area, happening upon the spill, tracing it back to the actual ruptured pipeline. They found the culvert, you know, that ended up having the pipe right. oil go under the freeway because initially they either didn't even know there was a pipe there or wouldn't have thought it could have come over the freeway without anyone noticing, <laughs> so, which is not usually something that happens. So they're actually charged with discharging a pollutant in the water, killing wildlife, that's the taking charges with fish and game, and the failing to notify authorities. And what, what so. does the government see, or what's the county and the state, what do they, they, they're, they want to put guys in jail or they want money? No, it's about money because they're charging a company. Um, there was one named employee, but that's been dropped out of it, so it's just the company right now. So what possible defense does Plains have? <laughs> so they... So far, it seems their defense is this was an accident. It's pretty much coming down to the arguments are it was an accident versus it was preventable and you should have known something like this could happen. And so Plains' defenses, they haven't, they haven't done their direct yet. They're doing cross-examination. But it seems like they're saying they went above and beyond what the regulations said they should do to try and prevent external corrosion, which was determined to be the cause of the rupture that caused the spill. So they're saying we did all we could to try and prevent this from happening so it was an accident and we did what we could. So a lot of times when you have a case involving a big corporation, oh say an oil corporation wearing black hats and, and mm -hmm. the government, I mean they bring in these really slick lawyers and stuff. What, 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 what's the kind of legal lineup? What does that look like? Yeah, it's big. It's a big lineup. There are a lot of attorneys on both sides in court. Uh, they have They've made an effort in opening statements, especially, which is kind of their introduction to the jury after the process of selecting them, is saying we're not just a big, evil Texas company. We have a lot of California employees and a lot of California offices. We're all hardworking men and women just trying to do our best, basically. And so they're trying to, to go light plane. They're making it very clear Plains is not denying they're responsible for this bill. They're just denying the criminal charges. So nobody's really challenging the facts of what no, happened. No, no one's challenging. There was a spill. It was their fault because they owned and operated the pipeline that ruptured, causing the spill. Yeah. And who's the judge? Uh, it's James Herman, Judge yeah. James Herman. Uh, is, he yeah. a, is he a known pro-environment sympathizer? Do you know? I don't know. No. No. What's your take on this whole case? Do you, I mean, I, I, I just, I'm scratching my head about what are they going to the criminal, uh, yeah, they, what, what's the amount of money that they're seeking? I don't remember the full amount. It, it's for all of the charges. I think the, it's something like 45 total charges and there are money amounts attached to each one, but I don't remember. But you were saying that the government didn't really mention the charges in their opening. <laughs> yeah, so they didn't specifically, they laid out the case for why they laid out their case, but they didn't specifically go through the charges that Plains is facing in this trial. And today, Judge Herman did mention that a juror gave him a question on a slip of paper asking what the specific charges were so they could kind of have that Ouch. in their mind <laughs> as, they're, as they're watching the case. So I'm guessing they will make a more obvious presentation to the jury for that. They would have at the end of the case before they deliberate anyway. Yeah. Is it the yeah. first criminal case? For an oil spill, I mean, in off the coast of Santa Barbara County. I'm trying to think. I, think, I don't know if there was one for '69. Yeah, I don't either. Was there? Well, it was certainly um, certainly civil. Civil, yeah. And this is not the the. Um, this isn't the class action. Class, and that's Barry Capello. And that'll be L.A. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> there, but there are a lot of civil suits out. happening, but this is the criminal one. All right. Um, <laughs> What, what, to remind me, what, what was the deal with the, the automatic pipeline shutoff that yeah. wasn't, uh, is that coming up or is, what, what, what's? Mm, they didn't have to have them because they were an interstate pipeline. It was classified as an interstate, interstate. pipeline. Interstate. Yes, not intrastate. That so means it was between states. Yes. <laughs> Even though this, their particular pipeline that ruptured is a very short pipeline. It's connected through Santa Barbara County and California. It doesn't actually leave the state. 
but they had it classified that way with federal regulation, and federal regulation doesn't require the same stuff that the county requires for its pipelines. And it's the pipelines. only one of its size and of its kind in here, or in the county that didn't yeah. have the shutoff valve. Yeah. But does it, didn't, didn't Lois do something that, to, to, didn't she get some legislation passed? Or? Yeah, she tried, she tried to close a, a loophole in that area. Yeah. I have to get back I to you on that. Yeah, I don't remember, I don't remember what happened. So how long is the trial going to go on? Probably three months, they were guessing, and, and so you'll just go direct from home every morning and <laughs> cover the trial for the trial's six or not, eight hours? No, the trial's not every day, and I won't be going every day. But that, that <laughs> jury is going to be very busy for a long time. They're not being sequestered. No. And, and the other thing I was interested in, there's hardly any coverage. I mean, you're covering, and mm -hmm. Nick's covering. Nick, Nick yeah. went, but Katie mm -hmm. White, went one day. But nobody else, the LA Times, or I mean... It was a big deal at the time. Yeah, I think so. I'm sure people will come in for clothing. I would imagine come in for come in at the end and for the verdict. But yeah, today it was just me. Hmm. Wow. All right. Well, we'll look for three more months of coverage. Yeah. Newsmakers with Jr. Are you going to be there? Come on the down. Room? Why are you looking at everyone else when you can do it yourself? <laughs> because I'll just link to your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Works for me. <laughs> I have, Bloggers. We love I have, no, come on. I have to cover the vacancies on District 3, right. a key <laughs> issue in the charter reform. Well, Linda, so the soups overrode the design concerns of some Montecito residents and voted for the hurry up, like to like rebuild legislation in the mudslide disaster zone. Why? Well, let's go back to the tea fire of 2008. That was the first time that the county passed an ordinance. It was a disaster ordinance allowing the 200 or so burned down homes, the owners, to build back the same house in the same place, the same height, the same design, and not have to go through expensive and time-consuming design review or zoning permits. All they had to do was get a building permit. No notice to neighbors, no appeals allowed. So along comes the debris flow. And it's uh, 10 times worse than the fire in many ways. It, leaves, it, le it might leave four feet of mud on your property, which you now have to build on top of. It might put the creek bank uh, 15 feet back towards your house. You have to comply with a 50-foot setback. So you have to move your house. And, and that's why they uh, wanted to pass amendments, which they did on Tuesday, that allowed the debris flow victims to avoid those expensive design reviews and zoning permits, even if they had to move their house somewhere else on their lot or raise the height of it because of the mud. And, and that it opens the door to lots of scenarios that the neighbors are worried about. <clears throat> and of course, Doss Williams was leading the charge on this, and you know, Josh, I would never use the words arrogance and Doss Williams in the same sentence, but is this not the height of arrogance to allow people to rebuild in exactly the same place where they just got wiped out? Well, um, they can if they want. If, if, if they're still 50 feet from the creek, <clears throat> yes, they could build there. They could be four feet higher. Um, but we don't have the maps yet. We don't know what... Yeah, the, the groups, the Montecito Planning Commission and the Montecito um, Board of Architecture Review wanted the supervisors to wait uh, until um, after FEMA comes out with the floodwater elevations in June. They're going to issue a map. And, that, and then you'll know on your property where the flood line is based on the new topography. And you have to be, your first floor has to be two feet above that under county rules. So, uh, you know, the, the groups said, let's wait until the map comes out and then we can see what areas of Montecito we really need to be strategic about and plan better for to make them more resilient. The board did not want to do that. That would have been three more months for those people who are out of their homes watching the clock tick on their um, insurance policies for living expenses. And, and they didn't want to um, to hold it. What was the back. vote? Was it unanimous? It was unanimous. Got a standing ovation. 
people were really um, relieved, I think, to... So no one from Montecito Association or their plant? The association spoke, um, and, uh, you know, it was a divided vote and, and vote and very heated debates at the association. Um, not so much the Planning Commission, that was a unanimous vote. But, uh, you know, people saying, well, have a heart. You can't put more barriers into, in front of people. And, and other people saying, but we just want the neighbors to be at the table at some point. Uh -huh. And, uh, so it sounds like more work for lawyers in our future. I could mean, be. People are going to be upset about things. But I, I do keep coming back to the safety issue. I mean, I'm serious about that. It just seems strange to give the green light to... to well, one question that uh, the, the Planning Commission asked was, why are we trying to help people to get back immediately into their homes when we know that there's a five-year, potentially a five-year uh, window when we could have another debris flow, even one that's not a, as big could still be deadly in Montecito, unless the uh, vegetation comes back faster than we think. And there's virtually no change up there. I mean, it, it, you look at the pictures, it's like a little green over here, and then maybe way over there, a little green. Five to 10% only has come back. So it's another season of um, anxiety. And what do your FEMA sources say about this decision? Of the supervisors? Yeah. Well, they stay out of it. You see, they, I asked FEMA whether the, FEMA was going to prohibit building on any parcels in Montecito, and they said, no, we don't do that. We just draw the, the floodwater elevation, and then the, the local jurisdiction, in this case the county, decides um, uh, whether it's going to approve or not um, a proposal. And the county has said that anyone who wants to re rebuild will be allowed to rebuild. Wow. All right, well, Melinda, once again, on all, behalf of all the major news organizations, NewsHawk, The Independent, and <laughs> Newsmakers with JR, thank you for your coverage and your, your community spirit and providing it to, to everybody. It really is a great service. And thank you all for watching. Thanks to tonight's panel, Josh Molina, Tyler Hayden, Gina Magnoli, and Melinda Burns. Please visit our website, Newsmakers with JR, to check out my regular blog posts on politics and media in Santa Barbara and beyond. And our YouTube channel, where you'll find an archive of all our past shows when you have a lot of time. You'll want to be binge watching those and special interviews. Thanks to our director, JP Montalvo, to our crew, Susie, Lauren, Mark, and as always, our top ranking, high powered senior executive producer, Hap Freund. We'll see you next time on Newsmakers. Thanks. <laughs>